Wow, thanks for that. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, where are we? Yep. Let me just get this. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are the content structure team uh, for Macmillan. Uh, we manage all the XML content for uh, the NPG, Nature Branded Scientific Technical Medical Journals, and also Palgrave Journals, which are uh, Business, and Humanities, and Social Sciences. Um, so, uh, there's three of us here. Um, so, the talk's divided into three sections. Uh, four sections. I'm going to talk about the initial mapping process, mapping our DCDs into JATs. Um, then Jenny here will talk about our migration program and the workflows that we developed. Uh, Ashwin will show us the development process and the system architecture. Uh, and then I'll round up with some of the challenges that we encountered and some of the lessons that we learned. So um, the Journals Division in Macmillan was formed from a number of different business units split across different offices and with different tools and workflows uh, being used in those offices uh, for different groups of journals. Um, this is a bit of a history lesson. By the late 2000s, uh, the system in Macmillan was a fragmented collection of disjointed and disparate publishing tools uh, written in different languages uh, with no common architecture and they required many manual steps to complete article publication. Similarly, there were three in-house article DTDs that we inherited from those business units. Uh, despite what uh, Debbie says, uh, we thought they were poorly designed and poorly documented. And as a result, the article XML that we produced was inconsistent and fairly error prone. So at that time, the technology team in Macmillan realized that the use of multiple DTDs uh, would hinder and increase the cost of redevelopment of our publishing tools. So in 2008, we started looking at unifying our XML uh, markup into one DCD. Our own DCDs had been developed by different people over time without a consistent design approach, and we judged they weren't suitable for use in the long term. Um, developing a new DCD or schema from scratch was also not considered to be a serious option. We wanted an existing DTD that we could adopt and adapt to our needs with relatively minimal effort. The NOM DTD at that time was already being used by some other publishers and was under active development, and we thought that was seen to be as, as an obvious choice. Um, so the initial mapping of our DTDs to the NLM DTD, which was then at version 2.3, we concluded that while the mapping was feasible, the NLM DTD would need some significant extensions in order to handle our existing data structures. Um, later on that year, a major revision of the NLM DTD was released, and in 2010, we created uh, a full mapping of our DTDs to this version. The significant enhancements made to the NLM DTD at that time greatly reduced the number of extensions that we anticipated that we would need. In 2011, we look to review and finalize those mappings. However, we discovered that the previous mappings did not take into account the actual use of the elements in our actual XML. <laughs> no surprises there. Some elements were used extremely rarely. Some were used for the wrong purposes. Some contained incomplete or invalid data. And some contained data that really should belong in other elements. And this example is of a type of publication date. The initial mappings mapped it fair enough to a PubDate element. But when we actually looked into the actual XML, we found it only been used in 10 articles in one supplement. So we decided just to remove this date. Um, unfortunately, we had uh, quite a number of uh, business organization changes and staff changes, and we had an, an awful lot of competition with other work. So it took a whole year to finalize this anal analysis and mapping based on our XML content. Uh, when we came to writing the XLT transforms to convert between the DTDs, some additional standardization was needed. Uh, similar data items had slightly different structures in our own AJ and NPG DTDs, and these needed to map to unified structures in JATs. 
Now, for reasons that we'll explain later, we needed to convert both to JATs and also from JATs to our own DTDs. And when it came to the back conversion, those unified structures had to be mapped back to both the AJ and the NPG DTDs. And this slide shows an example of this, where the AJ and the NPG DTDs supported different types of list. If an article authored in JATs used a list type that wasn't available in the DT to which it was being converted, the closest alternative list type was used. So now I'm going to hand over to Jenny, who will discuss the migration program and the workflows that we developed. Right, thank you, Paul. There we go. So, uh, program kickoff. Uh, so, JATS obviously was really good as far as us geeks in the basement thought. Uh, fortunately, also the business realised that continuing to use the existing DTDs and the existing production processes was not going to be sustainable and definitely not scalable. So in March 2012, um, a new program was kicked off to overhaul all our production systems and improve customer experience with JATS at the core. The eventual goal for the company was to make more money. Uh, and by customer experience, I mean external customers, that's our subscribers, obviously, but also we host a lot of society journals. We want to get more of those publishing their journals on our sites. Internal customers are the editors and publishers who also want to publish new journals or increase the functionality of their existing journals. And also the uh, production staff who have to use our systems. Our website, it's a bit cluttered. <laughs> There's a variety of designs for article pages and often in the same journal. This is because of the way we've developed new article designs over the years. As Paul says, we have two existing uh, in-house DTDs, AJ and MPG. When we do new development, we tend to just do it for the MPG DTD because we don't want the cost of developing for both DTDs. This means that any new functionality will make it onto the AJ DTD quite a few years after the other one, or more likely never. <laughs> we never retrospectively apply new designs to old articles because we don't want the cost and the time that takes to actually QA to make sure all the information that was in the original designed page is still there in the new design. So this means that even in Nature, supposedly our flagship journal, you get a variety of look and feel. And for uh, in-house people trying to sell our journals to societies our, and our, our pages, it doesn't look great if they see a very old-looking, unfashionable design. Another thing our subscribers want to be able to do is actually find articles quickly and accurately. Our old search could take up to 10 seconds to load a search results page, and often the uh, article they were looking for wouldn't be anywhere near the top of the page. This meant that only 10% of searches actually resulted in a click-through to an article page. I guess most people just gave up and went to PubMed. So for our internal customers, it's all about speed. They have many needs. They want to reduce the amount of time it takes to set up new journals. Uh, for example, uh, a marketing site, which is basically, this is what our new journal will be, some information for authors, a button to say, submit an article, could take up to four months to launch. A full journal site with content would be up to eight months. We also wanted to reduce the number of manual processes involved in processing our XML content when it arrived, and also to reduce the number of manual processes involved in creating HTML. Uh, and, and by doing this, we would reduce the amount of time from acceptance of an article to publication. The main ways we thought we could do that would be to automate XML validation, and also to render articles directly out of MarkLogic, our XML database. I believe other XML databases are available. So here's a, a very uh, generic and uh, simplified version of our workflow at that time. Uh, you'll understand there's probably a lot more mm, that are involved. So what happened was that typesetters would FTP XML and article assets, that's the images, PDF, uh, to us, because they're based in India mostly, uh, and our production teams are in the UK and the USA, they would often sit there for quite a few hours before anyone started work on them. 
the uh, production people would then do manual uh, validation using oxygen. And if there were any errors, in many cases, those would be sent back to the typesetter for correction. Again, with a time overhead, waiting for things to be picked up and returned. Or they could do the correction themselves. Once everything was uh, valid and in the right place, it would be put on to the file system. Then we run a whole bunch of different tools to do different things, as Paul said, all written in various different languages. Uh, and they would do things like uh, resizing of the images, putting article reference information into our relational databases, uh, and then once those tools have been run, HTML pages would be generated. And this is physical HTML pages for the article, full article page, figure and table pages, abstracts, uh, TOCs, etc. When we finally finish that, we can actually do our web check. When the article is signed off, the XML will be uh, added into the um, uh, MarkLogic database. We have two separate environments. Uh, staging, where all the production work is done. And then when the article is signed off and ready to be published, everything gets loaded into our live environment. Uh, we also generate uh, Crossref and PubMed and other third-party information at that stage. Again, the live deployment is uh, a manual process. Someone has to actually go in and push a button saying, move all those things across. Uh, and it's quite often just... Uh, monitored by the, uh, having a spreadsheet. So, so, so we wanted to change that in quite a big way. So the idea was we would get rid of the manual submission via a type of FTP site. All assets would be submitted to a system which would validate that the XML was correct. All the assets that were declared in the XML for the article would be uh, submitted at the same time and no extra. Once the system had validated that that had happened, everything would automatically be saved into one environment, which we named the Content Hub. We would remove all the legacy tools, and because everything's in the Content Hub already, and we want to render article pages on the fly, the web check can then take place immediately. Once an article has been signed off, has been correct, it will be scheduled through an interface. And as soon as that date and time has been reached, the article is immediately available to our customers on the live site. The third party data is generated automatically and sent out. Obviously, this is quite a huge difference to what we have before. And unfortunately, we only had one small development team. We knew we couldn't reach this stage in one hit. So we adopted an iterative, agile approach. I say agile, it was kind of a flavor of agile because we were a small team. We had people doubling up on their roles. Uh, I was product owner and also XML expert. It, uh, I'm happy to say that only uh, continued like that for a few months and I got to go and play with the pointy brackets full time after a while. So we were given the goal that all our journal articles for every single Nature publication would come in in JATS within six months of the start of the project. They realized that uh, this was um, a major undertaking, so what they wanted to do was that even though the articles came in as JATS, all our existing production processes would stay the same. This meant that we would remove the uh, FTPing of the article XML, we would still continue to FTP article assets, the article XML would come in and be automatically validated. To do this, we built a tool called the XML Gateway. It was a very simple browser-based tool. You could upload either a single XML file or a zip of multiple XML files. The Gateway would send the article to a validation service. We deliberately built the validation service to be a separate endpoint so that it could be re reused by tools that we knew we wanted to build in the future. So the validation service would validate against the JAPS DTD, but also against an additional Schematron layer. I'm not going to talk too much about Schematron because I know the Mulberry ladies will be discussing that tomorrow in more depth. 
Once an article had passed the validation layer, it would be sent, the JAX XML would go into Mark Logic, but then we would transform the XML back into the in-house DTD, either AJ or MPG, and that would be used to go through all the existing tools, create the HTML, and um, check the article page. The plan was that all the corrections would be done in the in-house XML. And then, once the article was signed off, we would transform that back into JATS to put into MarkLogic. We realized fairly early on that this was going to be a really bad idea. <laughs> we, <laughs> as you can all tell. Uh, we had concerns just in the way that the tool would have to work in order to support that, but also in the way that the uh, existing legacy tools ran. A lot of the times people were having to, shall we say, be creative in the way they marked things up in order to make the article page look correct. We knew that some of those things would create invalid JAPs if we tried to transform it back. We might just lose the information completely, or the transforms will just fall over completely. Luckily for us, around this time, the business also started to get a bit nervous about having all of our journals in JATS within six months. So they decided that we would only use JATS for new, online-only academic journals, open access. Um, and they would be published directly onto the new platform that one of the other development teams was working on, which meant that we didn't have to worry about that back conversion from AJ and MPG back into JATS. We'd already done a fair amount of work on the transforms themselves at this stage. That wasn't wasted. At this stage, we converted one of our existing uh, in-house academic journals uh, into JATS uh, and loaded it onto our test environment so that could be used by the team working on the new platform to make sure that they were supporting all the necessary functionality. And we also now use the transforms, or we'll be starting to use the transforms, for converting our archive. So what are we currently doing? Once we'd finished working on the XML gateway, we then went for a full-blown content gateway, which, as well as Article XML, actually copes with all the article assets as well. So as well as the DTD and Schematron validation, we have some extra steps where we validate that all the article assets uh, that we expect, which are declared in the article XML for figure images, table images, etc., are actually there in the zip as well. The gateway automatically stores all these assets onto the file server. Unfortunately, we still need to transform the JATS into the in-house DTD. This is because some of our legacy tools, legacy tools still need to be run. For example, the uh, article database. Uh, and unfortunately, also the third-party XML for Crossref PubMed still comes from our proprietary DTDs, as we can see here. Uh, and, uh, but the good thing is the uh, article pages are now generated directly out of MarkLogic on the fly, so the web check can be done a lot quicker than it used to be. Uh, the push live process is very similar to the old system, the only difference being that the JATS XML is what goes into live mark logic. So, one of the reasons we picked JATS, and one of the main reasons, is the documentation. We were discussing with Debbie and Tommy at lunchtime how our proprietary DTDs have not had documentation for quite a while, and I actually just had a look. The uh, MPG DTD, the last date we have for documentation is 2005. The AJ DTD, slightly better, 2007. I'm happy to say I wasn't with the company at that point, so it's not my fault. <laughs> so we, lo <laughs> sorry, boss. So we love the documentation. It takes a huge amount of work off us because we can point to that to our typesetters and say please go and refer to this as your first port call. All we have to do is write an additional layer of tagging instructions for the extra flavor of things that we want. For example, please use MathML. And then we back this up with our Schematron. There are some other opportunities which are not necessarily 
directly related to having JAPs, but which we thought would be good to introduce at the same time. In parallel with the development of the gateways, another team was working on the structure of the content hub, which Paul mentioned. Uh, one of the things that they worked on was uh, introduction of ontologies for all sorts of information, which will Ashwin will give us more information on later. But we use it within the Schematron as lookup files, so we can ensure that when an article is submitted, the right journal ID is used, there aren't any typos in the journal title, correct ISSNs, etc. And we also use it to validate that subject terms have been used correctly. And my personal favourite is the introduction of MathML. We've got rid of horrible, fuzzy, inaccessible images that we had on our old platform, and we now have lovely MathJax rendered, clickable, accessible MathML instead. I'm now going to pass on to Ashwin, who's going to speak more about the development methodology we followed and the testing methods used. Thank you, Jenny. Um, just to recap, some, as you can see, some of the workflows that Jenny mentioned, there was a lot of variation throughout the whole development process. Um, one of the things this whole program of work was, was quite, um, it wasn't spec'd out fully. It was a lot of unknowns. Um, it wasn't something that would have fallen into uh, waterfall development methodology. So for that reason, we actually adopted um, Scrum methodology, a, a Scrum development process, and that's an iterative process. Um, this was used whilst uh, Paul had also already done the mapping of the transformations, it was still felt that um, it would be useful to use the Scrum development methodology for the transforms as well. The Scrum development team comprises of three roles, which are product owner, Scrum master, and the development team. Um, the product owner is responsible for the product backlog, or the main uh, project goals, and they're held in a priority list, a prioritized list. Um, also, their, their other role is to actually ensure that the product that is being delivered is the correct product and is de delivering the most business value. Scrum Master, their main role is to help facilitate that the team is uh, following the Scrum process and also to remove impediments to following the process and to block distractions. The development team are a self-organizing and cross-functional team. Um, they can only really be called developers, but they do encompass different disciplines such as analysts, developers, quality assurance. A sprint backlog um, is a list of tasks that the Scrum team commit to completing by the end of a sprint. Um, in the diagram, it shows a sprint uh, of a duration of one to four weeks. We opted for a two-week duration. Um, let's see. There are also the main artifacts are product backlog, the sprint backlog, and actually uh, a, pretend, a shippable product increment. Um, there are some key events. Uh, they are a sprint planning meeting, which is when the team actually decide how much they can actually commit to. Um, also, there is a review where the actual product is uh, demoed to uh, stakeholders. That could be end users, customer service, and so on. And also then a, re a retrospective, which uh, helps the team to find areas of, for improvement for the next uh, sprint. Um, one of the key things also with Scrum was uh, the adoption of key development or key agile development practices. They are test-driven development, automated build of software art artifacts, and continuous integration. I'll just describe test-driven development. Um, why adopt test-driven development? Um, one of the main reasons is that testing is not uh, solely for the person who takes on Q 
QA responsibility. It enforces due diligence by developers. Um, they are then actually made to forced to think of what they actually need to test, how they actually test a piece of functionality, and also to force the developer to think of a wider range of feedback. Uh, sorry, a wider range of scenarios. Because they think of the scenarios, this then encourages uh, communication and discussion across the whole team uh, with the product owner and also uh, QA team members. It may seem at first that there is an overhead in writing additional code to test implementation code. The, however, the benefits are code implementation is actually shorter, uh, a large number of tests limit the number of defects reported, and also it facilitates refactoring of the code base. Um, so, unit testing. Um, I haven't actually given an example of, say, how it's been used in the actual services that were built. This is an example for testing the transforms. Um, and for that, XML unit was actually chosen um, as a framework for that. Um, the reason for choosing it was that it would um, incorporate into our existing build and continuous integration tools. XML unit has several classes that are of use. One is a transform class, which enables a transformation on a given input XML and a specified XSLT. It also has an XML assert class, which contains a variety of methods to test the, um, the structure and the content of transformation results. In this example, You can see here, you can, it's testing it for the presence of a gene sequence element and also the content of that gene sequence element. It can also then um, be used to compare the result of whole transformation, the result of transforming a whole article against target samples and confirming that they are identical. Um, also, another way of uh, checking sure or making sure that there is no loss of data, you could actually then do a round trip. You transform to your target and then from the target back to the original and compare those two and there you can ensure that no data has been lost. Finally, it can also provide a means of ensuring that the transformation results are valid against their target DTDs. One thing I would like to point out is that test-driven development and unit testing are not magic bullets. There, there are other practices that need to be adopted in making sure the product uh, is delivered to high quality. That could be performance and low testing and high volume testing. The new content gateway, validation and transformation services um, have been connected to our previously existing services such as the content ingestion service, triple store and hub API to create a scalable architecture that makes the Macmillan content hub. The central piece of the content hub is a MarkLogic database which holds all the articles published on nature.com and palgravejournals.com. Another piece of the content hub is the NPG ontology, which is a continually expanding set of taxonomies and vocabularies that cover the data in our graph. These cover publications, journals, subjects, article types, article relations, publication events, and document components. These ontologies are referenced by our workflow tools and in particular by our validation service to ensure data validity of journal titles, subjects, article types, and article relations. The ontology also drives our process for populating our triple store with RDF data. Some of the RDF data is then incorporated into the article metadata held within MarkLogic to, use, to be used for search and article rendering.
the big picture. So how do these applications and tools uh, now fit into the wider program? So the new publishing platform, um, the article pages within it are now uh, generated on the fly, and we no longer have HTML files um, stored on a file server, and no, no, then, no subsequent need to FTP them onto that server. Um, the publishing platform requests JATS from MarkLogic and generates um, the web pages on the fly using JSON as an intermediate step. It incorporates a dynamic image resizing tool so that production teams no, ling no longer have to create images in different sizes with our legacy tools. It also pu pulls in additional article information from the Content Hub to generate links to related articles. It's also been designed to re resize content nicely on PC, tablet, and mobiles. The development of New Search was based on our Content Hub API and has significantly improved this facility for our customers. The results load, load page. The results page load time has been reduced from 10 seconds to less than a second. Just try and demo that. Ah. On the left is old search, on the right is new search. As you can see it's substantially faster. Whilst in beta, um, with only 10% of users using it automatically, click-through th click rates increased from 10 to 25%. Other benefits. Marketing site launches have reduced from two months to two weeks, and full journal launches reduced from eight months to four months. Um, from the period of January 2014 to January 2015, uh, we have been able to launch four open access online only society journals. Scientific Data, our first open access peer reviewed publication for descriptions of scientifically valuable data sets. Um, Palgrave Communications, our first Palgrave title, and Nature Plants, which is our first issue based subs subscription research journal. I'll now, I'll now hand over to Paul, who will describe some of the challenges we faced and the lessons we have learned. Thank you, Ashwin. So there were quite a few challenges that we had to deal with while doing this work. Um, one of these was the continued need to deliver new XML models. In particular, our new journal, Scientific Data, had a number of new features which required modeling. One of these, for example, was the recording for display of study parameters. These are subject-like phrases which identify the methods, protocols, organisms, and research design approaches used to create the data sets described by these articles. And this slide shows part of the visual modeling that I had to do for these. Now that we've adopted JATS as a preferred DCD, in the short term, which now looks for about two years, we now have four DTDs. This, is increased, this would increase the amount of code needed to process and display the article information, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve here. So to mitigate against that, we have created an additional layer of metadata held in MarkLogic, which Ashwin referred to briefly there, uh, which is standardized across the DTDs. Um, this shows uh, an X query uh, which runs on a uh, jets, I think. No, this is uh, this is MPG DCD uh, to create that um, standardised format. And this slide shows the resulting standardised format. Um, the information is used uh, by our new search and our new publishing platform, uh, which query Mark Logic directly. Um, and this is an example of an author in our standardised form. So. Uh, Next steps. So right now, we've built the core of our content hub and our API interfaces, and have launched a number of new journals marked up in JATS and rendered on our new platform. But there's still much work to do to complete our new publishing platform. There are a number of teams working on different aspects of this, but for our team, the key next steps are 
Firstly, to complete work required to enable publishing within a single environment. Instead of having a staging and a live environment, we want to just have a single live environment um, with an option for viewing articles that are not ready, uh, readily visible for our, our users. Um, and this requires versioning of both articles and assets. Secondly, to replace our archaic applications for delivering our articles to third parties for indexing, archive and discovery, um, like PubMed Central and EBSCO. Uh, the work for that will also support integration with some of our internal customers. And thirdly, and largely, to complete the conversion of our archive XML to JATS. We now have a system and a process to allow us to do this both rapidly and efficiently. But given that we have more than a million articles to convert, we estimate this will take more than a year to complete. Lessons learned. Don't start from here. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not something we can do, and we regard with some jealousy the recent journal startups like eLife and PRJ, who have no cumbersome, le cumbersome legacy systems to support. Secondly, when trying to convert large amounts of XML created across a span of years to a new format, do not rely solely on the content models or the DTDs. There will always be invalid and dirty data hiding in the XML to trip you up. Thirdly, using XQuery in an XML database really helps to identify those edge cases, those dirty data, and also the counts of the various occurrences that you might have. Fourthly, use Agile and Scrum development methodology to build and grow your new systems and tools. This will allow you to support large-scale developments involving multiple teams, whilst also supporting your existing architecture. And finally, JATS is the best journal article DTD that we know. <laughs> With us all working together, we can make it even better. Thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, Greg Fagan from Data Conversion Laboratory. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you all for sharing your bumps in the road and your processes with us. I've been around publishing long enough to know that every publisher has gone through, uh, if not the same, similar problems with, with migrating content uh, to, to digital platforms and output, so you're not alone. Um, I have about 600 questions about your various <laughs> workflows, <laughs> but I'll pare it down to two in the interest of time. Um, when your production staff in your current workflow um, is, is reviewing uh, article content that you've, that you've gotten back and you're checking before it goes up live, um, how are they viewing it? Is, it? is it rendered into HTML for them to view? Yes. And then rendered. if they find things wrong, then how, where are they going to make the corrections? So it depends on the nature of the, yes, they are, they are viewing the HTML only to decide whether something is wrong. If they find something that they decide is wrong, it depends on the nature uh, of the error and also how close they are to uh, the intended publication date. Um, if the error is small or if, they, if they're really close to the wire, then they will make the changes themselves directly in the XML. But the preferred option is to return that XML to the, back to the original typesetters for correction and for it to go through the whole process again. All right, thank you. Um, and my other question is, you mentioned that you had moved from having someone push a button to make content live to scheduling it. Um, how are you doing it currently? And how would, how would scheduling it be any faster than someone pushing a button and making it live instantaneously? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily faster in itself to do, the, to do that. Uh, but it does mean it can be done uh, much further ahead of time. So uh, to make an article live under the old system, it needed someone there present uh, in the room at that time focused on that particular task of making those particular articles or those issues live at that time. Um, it does also mean that we can therefore only go live with an article uh, during office hours for whichever office where uh, those people are working in. Um, Scheduling, on the other hand, um, allows us to uh, decide the publication date and time of an article much further in advance. Uh, and once an article is scheduled, we can then forget about it and it will automatically go, go live without anyone else having to do any other, any other steps. 
Thank you. Mark Donahue from IEEE, uh, no relation. Um, <laughs> how do you go about uh, selecting and managing the ontologies you use in your semantic layer? Uh, okay, so un unfortunately the, the person who uh, manages our, our ontologies isn't, isn't here today. Um, but I've done a little bit of, of help uh, on that. Um, we try to use uh, existing ontologies uh, where possible, um, like uh, Bebo, for example, um, and where they, they seem to uh, fit with our, our intended purposes. Um, but for a significant number of our uh, data, data sets and uh, data items, uh, we have created our own uh, NPG uh, namespaced ontology. Um, so our uh, overall ontology is a mixture of NPG and various other uh, ontologies. Debbie. Debbie LaPere, Mulberry Technologies. I would like to absolutely applaud you for standing up and saying in public that DTD to DTD transform ought to be database to DTD transform. What have we actually used? We were hired to write some XML, XSLT transforms for a client, and we looked at the database to database transform, and we said, oh, this is going to be horrible. And we ran some statistics, and we said, excuse me, you have 400,000 articles. This tag has been used four times, and two of those are incorrect. Can we talk about this? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. One of the other advantages which we didn't really mention there is, the, is uh, for our ongoing uh, conversion. Um, so uh, and under a, a previous uh, instance of our, our desired, or what we thought then was our desired process, would be, we would hand our data over to a typesetter who would then convert a whole bundle of articles, 25,000 at a time, hand them back to us, we'd check them, say they were okay or not. Once we said they were okay, we'd push a button and that would be it, be a finalized. With this system, we can do dynamic transformations. So uh, we can transform pretty much already, uh, we can transform all our archive XML into JATS and have it on the website. Now at the moment that means that large parts of the article will be missing, bits will be non-functional, but we can have an iterative approach to fixing that and gradually reduce and uh, improve those articles until at such point they decide, okay, we know there's a small number of errors left, but we're happy with actually what we've got. We can now go live with this in JATS. And that means that uh, the, we, we no longer have to do it in uh, fixed batches, and we can do it at our own schedule uh, in our own time. And it, it means we can, uh, our uh, customers in editorial and publishing are much more, uh, can be much more satisfied with the results of our transformations and happy that, with the quality of what we, uh, what we provide. Evan Owens, Sunveo. Um, again, I would agree with Debbie and reinforce that for everyone that large data transformation projects, knowing what is actually in the data, what is used is key. That was key at Portico. We do it in Sunveo in our business. Um, you, you, know, you could have an entire corpus that has a DTD that has book reviews in the DTD, but they never actually published any book reviews. So don't mess with that markup. No instances. But my question for you is, um, in your collection of content, obviously you have many traditional scholarly journals, but you also have Nature, which has many magazine-like features and a beautiful thing. Did you have any challenges in mapping all the different chunks of content in Nature into JATS that you could share um, with the JATS committee? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, we did. We did have a, num a number of challenges, but those challenges are not over. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we, we started off by, as, as Ashwin said, we started by, by publishing uh, brand new uh, open access society journals in, in, in JATS. And for our transformation or conversion program, we've uh, decided to start with some of the easier journals, uh, in, both in terms of structure and in terms of, of dirty data. And uh, there, we're only at the beginning of the process, so we're actually right now starting to, in the middle of processing our first major journal. Um, 
If it was down to me, I would have Nature right at the end of that process as the very last journal. But of course, business concerns may come into this and they may decide that Nature needs to be done a bit sooner. Um, but we're fully aware that uh, each new journal or each group of journals that we come to will have new structures, new features, new bits of dirty data in them that we haven't encountered before. Uh, and so this uh, having a, a dynamic transformation and an iterative process will enormously help in going forward. And uh, with enough upfront analysis and uh, comparison, we can be relatively honest with our business owners as to roughly how complex, how difficult, how challenging each journal or each set of journals will be. And Nature is not only our uh, most complex journal, it's also the journal with our largest amount of content. We have, I think we've got about a quarter of a million articles in Nature alone. Uh, and from my perspective, that is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, I have done a lot of the mapping for that, but we haven't yet written the transforms uh, for, for a lot of that. And we expect that to be one of our uh, most challenging journals to, yeah. to, to do. Well. Again, if you see things that come from its magazine, like features that, that are not in the JATS vocabulary, please feel free to <laughs> communicate with the JATS committee. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to join it. I'd love to join it. I'll hopefully be talking, talking with you guys fairly soon about that. Um, and remember, when you're doing magazines, abstracts are your friends. They are decks. They are that interesting description in the table of contents. They're the one you put in the back with the reference list. You could have 20 or 30 kinds of abstracts. Sure, sure, thank you. Yes, we already have about seven different types of abstract, yeah. And we, we also have, uh, some journals have uh, abstracts in multiple languages. And again, abstracts in JATS support that. As you see, no problem. Uh, it was about five minutes work for me to define what to do with that. Thank you very much. Paul, the follow-up question to that is, did you end up ultimately using JATS out of the box, or did you have to make modifications to it? We're using it out of the box. Um, we've been a bit creative with, uh, hopefully, with, with some of the, uh, the attribute values, um, but we are intending to, to use it out of the box. I should have said we're using the, the blue journal publishing uh, variant of, of JATS uh, with OASIS, model, OASIS tables. Mm -hmm. um, but we are using it out of the box, and we're going to strive extremely hard to keep it that way. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.